Hello, everybody. This is Margaret Harris welcoming you to our WHO press briefing from Geneva. Thanks for your patience on this Friday, July 10. Today, we want to tell you something about something really exciting, a new and exciting initiative called the Access Initiative for Quitting Tobacco to help over 1 billion tobacco users quit and reduce the risk of COVID-19. The lineup will be led by, of course, the WHO Director General, Dr. Tedros, uh, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreitius, followed by the, Her Royal Highness Princess Dina Mired of Jordan, the President for the Union for International Cancer Control and a global advocate for tobacco control. She will be followed by Mr. Thibaut Mongong, Executive Vice President, Worldwide Chairman, Consumer Health for Johnson & Johnson. And then after hearing about this new initiative, we'll move to our regular COVID-19 press briefing. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Dr. Tedros to begin proceedings. Dr. Tedros, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Today, WHO is launching the Access Initiative for Quitting Tobacco, which aims to help the world's 1.3 billion tobacco users quit during the pandemic. This initiative will help people freely access the resources they need to quit tobacco, like nicotine replacement therapy and access to a digital health worker for advice. Smoking kills 8 million people a year. But if users need more motivation to kick the habit, the pandemic provides the right incentive. Evidence reveals that smokers are more vulnerable than non-smokers to developing a severe case of COVID-19. The project is led by WHO together with the UN Interagency Task Force on Non-Communicable Diseases and brings together the tech industry, pharmaceutical and NGO partners like PATH and the Coalition for Access to NCD Medicines and Products. We thank our first manufacturing partners, Johnson & Johnson Consumer Health, who donated nearly 40,000 nicotine pipes. We're also ple pleased to introduce Florence, the world and WHO's first ever digital health worker based on artificial intelligence. Florence dispels myths around COVID-19 and tobacco and helps people develop a personalized plan to quit. Florence is available 24-7 via video stream or text to help people access reliable information. Florence was created with technology developed by San Francisco and New Zealand-based company Soul Machines with support from Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud. WHO is in the final stages of adding more partners and encourages pharmaceutical and tech companies to join this initiative, which will help people reduce their risk of COVID-19 and lead healthier lives. We will first launch the initiative in Jordan and then roll it out globally over the coming months. To tell you more about this initiative, I would like to introduce my sister, Her Royal Highness, Princess Dina of Jordan. Princess Dina is a longtime friend, the president of the Union for International Cancer Control and a lifelong advocate for global tobacco control. You have the floor, Princess. Can you hear? Um, thank you, Dr. Um, Tedros, for this innovative and life-saving uh, initiative. COVID-19 has required us all to don masks, and yet, ironically, at the same time, it has unmasked too many uncomfortable truths. One of those glaring truths is that some smoking tobacco in all of its forms, new and old, electronic and non-electronic, has shown us all that it has no benefits whatsoever to its users. On the contrary, it depletes one's health, one's hard-earned money, 
and now also puts the user in the highest risk group for not only contracting COVID-19, but also in spreading it, as well as not being able potentially to fight and survive the virus due to higher vulnerability to severe complications. I thank you, Dr. Tedros, from the bottom of my heart for your leadership, for not only facing off with the coronavirus, which is a Herculean task to say the least, but also in not neglecting the so-called underlying conditions, non-communicable diseases, NCDs, such as heart disease, cancer, lung disease, and diabetes, the epidemics that remain the major causes of preventable deaths in the world, totaling over 40 million in 2016. On the contrary, Dr. Tedros, you are maintaining and doubling down on our work to prevent and control those epidemics and the risk factors that cause them, starting with tobacco that is set to kill a billion this century if we do not do something about it. Jordan, my beloved country, has unfortunately been one of the many countries on the target list of the global tobacco industry. The latter, which lost its markets in developed countries, and now doubling their efforts in ensnaring and owning the lungs of our youth to consume their deadly products. According to a national survey in 2019, tragically, this has resulted in the deadly statistic of 82.5% of our men over 18 using tobacco or e-cigarettes, one of the highest rates in the world. And 60% of our youth between the ages of 13 to 15 are addicted to smoking. Not only does this impact families and communities, but it costs the country a great deal of money. In 2015, smoking cost Jordan 1.6 billion Jordanian dinars, including money spent on tobacco and smoking-related uh, diseases like cancer and other NCDs. That is why I am beyond pleased that Jordan will be the first country to launch the Access Initiative for Quitting Tobacco. This emphasizes the fact that smoking addiction is a disease that needs to be treated, thus destigmatizing smokers who often feel blamed and shunned for their own addiction, despite the fact that we all know that most users are victims of the tobacco industry's well-known tactics to trap the youth before they reach maturity and adulthood. This initiative will also help Jordanians access the information and tools they need to quit. I hope Florence speaks Arabic, by the way, but also offers them the nicotine replacement therapies and medications necessary to aid them in their journey of quitting and starting to lead healthier lives. Jordan is a proud party of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control and has a strong group of grassroots NGOs fighting for tobacco control. I might say most of them are women, just an FYI, that is shaking the status quo and improving step by step the enforcement of the law in Jordan. Just last week, the government of Jordan adopted a ban on smoking indoors in public places. The link between smoking and COVID-19 make it essential for governments to pass comprehensive tobacco control laws that will protect the health of their people during this pandemic and beyond. We must do better with this new initiative. The government can show that Jordan is invested in strengthening tobacco control measures and saving lives by implementing proven measures based on FCCC and WHO's empower, like banning tobacco use in public spaces. I would like to thank WHO again, and for you, Dr. Tedros, personally, for leading this innovative initiative, and all of our partners for their support, including Johnson & Johnson, for the significant donation of nicotine patches. This will help thousands of people overcome their addiction to nicotine and support them in their journey to a healthy life and free of addiction. Thank you, Dr. Tedros, again, for your leadership. We are so proud of you, and we are thinking of you day in, day out for all your efforts um, uh, on fighting the COVID-19 and on making sure that we don't lose ground on all the gains we did in public health. Thank you for everything. And yes, I feel so honored that you also call me, uh, call me your sister and a friend, and I feel the same way.
and thank you for Johnson and Johnson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Princess Dina, for those really powerful words and the great news about the actions being taken in, in Jordan on tobacco control and also for your support for the work against COVID-19. I'd now like to introduce uh, Mr. Thibaut Mongong, the uh, Chairman and the uh, vi ex Executive Vice President, my apologies, Worldwide Chairman, Consumer Health for Johnson & Johnson. Mr. Mongong, you have the floor. Yes, hi everyone, and we are very, very pleased to be uh, joining you today for, for this uh, important, important uh, event. At Johnson & Johnson, we are, we are committed to, to change the trajectory of, of health for humanity, as we all are uh, today. And, and this initiative will really help people quit smoking. Uh, this is a very important public health milestone. Uh, it was made possible through the close collaboration between public and private partners. And this is, I believe, what makes its potential to succeed uh, even greater. And when we hear Princess Dina, when we hear um, Dr. Peterson and, and the WHO's commitment, I have no doubt that this program is going to be uh, very, very successful, starting with Jordan, uh, but expanding well beyond uh, Jordan uh, in, the, in the future months. Uh, as we all know, good health is impossible without access to the right tools. We just heard about AI uh, and the right products. And in terms of uh, smoking cessation, we know that one simple patch of nicotine replacement therapy can change the trajectory of the health of a smoker. A and this is what we are talking about here. One smoker at a time, but with a commitment to a large scale impact allowing smokers to change the trajectory of, of their own health. And, and this is what uh, gets all of us at Johnson & Johnson, Johnson very excited about the, this program, our ability to make a difference. It will require, as always, the commitment from all of us, many different players, uh, the continued leadership from the WHO, government, NGOs, industry, uh, but no, now, uh, with COVID more than ever, uh, we really need to rally the world uh, behind uh, this, this opportunity to change the trajectory of the health of so many people around the world. So with this objective in mind, uh, Johnson & Johnson Consumer Health is, is proud to build upon Jane's longstanding collaboration with the WHO and, and participate to, to the program with a, a donation of uh, free products for smokers in need. And we are really committed to continuing to provide access to Nicorette nicotine replacement therapy around the world because we know that so many people around the world need our help to, uh, to quit smoking and get access to a better health, a better life and a better future. So thank you to all participants and thank you for your unwavering commitment to this very, very important initiative. We are counting on all of you to make it very successful. Thank you so much, Mr. Mongong, for all that you're doing to help smokers beat this terrible addiction. Now, I don't know if you're as curious as me, but I'd like to know who this Florence is. And we now have a video which I'd like to entitle The Unmasking of Florence. Does nicotine help protect you from COVID-19? There is currently insufficient information to confirm any link between tobacco or nicotine in the prevention or treatment of COVID-19. Nicotine replacement therapies, such as nicotine gum and patches, are designed to help smokers quit tobacco. Would you like to hear another COVID-19 mythbuster? Sure. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Margaret. That's our first uh, ever digital uh, health worker, and I hope she will give all the support uh, people need. And she is available 24/7, as I said earlier. Uh, again, thank you so much, my sister Princess Dina, and also thank you to Dr. Mongon. Uh, we really appreciate. Thank you for joining us and. Now back to 
COVID-19. Today, the world recorded 12 million cases. In the last six weeks, cases have more than doubled. Across all walks of life, we're, we're all being tested to the limit. For those in poverty with little or no access to quality health services, it's not only COVID-19 that threatens lives and livelihoods. Other diseases like measles, polio, and malaria all thrive when immunization is posed and supply chains for medical supplies are interrupted. WHO continues to work with partners to ensure that the poorest and most marginalized are prioritized. That means restarting routine immunization and ensuring that medical supplies reach health workers across the world. There is a lot of work still to be done. From countries where there is exponential growth to places that are loosening restrictions and now starting to see cases rise. We need leadership, community participation, and collective solidarity. Only aggressive action combined with national unity and global solidarity can turn this pandemic around. There are many examples from around the world that have shown that even if the outbreak is very intense, it can still be brought back under control. And some of these examples are Italy, Spain, South Korea, and even in the Harvey, a densely packed area in the mega city of Mumbai, a strong focus on community engagement and the basics of testing, tracing, isolating, and treating all those that are sick is key to breaking the chains of transmission and suppressing the virus. As we continue to tackle the pandemic, we're also looking into the origins of the virus. Two WHO experts are currently en route to China to meet, to meet with fellow scientists and learn about the progress made in understanding the animal reservoir for COVID-19 and how the disease jumped between animals and humans. This will help lay the groundwork for the WHO-led international mission into the origins. For all the challenges that COVID-19 has caused, it has also shown the way forward for other challenges that threaten humanity. The crisis of growing antimicrobial resistance is a slow motion tsunami where despite the rise in resistant infections, the research and development of new antibiotics has not caught up. Unless we take quick and sustained action, we risk a doomsday global scenario where common injuries and illnesses return to become major killers. The AMR Action Fund aims to tackle this by strengthening and accelerating the research and development of antibiotics through game-changing investments into biotechnology companies around the world. Whether it's COVID-19 or AMR, the best shot we have is to work together in national unity and global solidarity. I thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tedros. I'll now open the floor to questions. Do remember, we will be, as usual, we'll be providing simultaneous translation in all six UN languages and also Portuguese. So if you prefer to ask your questions in any of those languages, please do. You may all also listen in Hindi, but you cannot ask, ask your questions. And note, owing to the way Zoom is set up, you will need to go to the button marked Korean to access Arabic. Uh, with Dr. Tedros, we have our usual experts, Dr. Maria Van Kerkhoff, Technical Lead for COVID, Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director of Emergencies, and joining them is also Dr. Rudika Kretsch, Director of Health Promotion, who can answer your questions about the Access Initiative for Quitting Tobacco. So without further ado, I will go to the first question, and that is for Sarah Wheaton from Politico. So Sarah, please unmute yourself and go ahead. 
Yes, thank you very much for taking my question. Uh, uh, it's about the timing of the inde independent review panel that you announced yesterday. Um, and uh, when we've asked about this in the past after the World Health Assembly, uh, Dr. Tedros, you said that you would start, you would initiate the review when all the conditions we need we need are actually met. And Dr. Ryan, you noted that these are typically launched after the crisis is over. Um, furthermore, the Independent Oversight and Advisory Committee for the WHO Emergencies Program said in their inter interim report that while they recommended a review, they said, and I'm quoting, conducting such a review during the heat of the response, even in a limited manner, could disrupt WHO's ability to respond effectively. So Dr. Tedros, what conditions that you said needed to be met have, have now been met? And Dr. Ryan and Dr. Tedros, are you concerned about um, the effect on the response of the review happening? Thank you. Um, um, yes, I can, I, I can begin. Um, well, well, first of all, we're very used to, in, in certainly in the emergencies uh, program in WHO, of a constant process of, uh, of operational review, both uh, during and, and after events, and that's reviewing how our operations are running so we can improve those operations. So uh, that, that's a very important part of our DNA in terms of uh, optimizing the impact that we have at country level. Uh, the, uh, the Independent uh, Oversight and Advisory Committee also reports to our governing bodies, as you know, to the Executive Board and to the World Health Assembly on a six-monthly basis, and again reviews uh, all of our operations on the ground. Um, this uh, evaluation uh, that has been mandated by the World uh, Health Assembly uh, uh, asking the Director General to uh, carry out uh, an independent evaluation, uh, that is the will of the uh, member states of WHO. Uh, we believe that it is, uh, has been constructed in good faith to learn the lessons that we're learning so far. It is uh, presented as both a process of gaining <coughs> interim learning from the response so far, uh, and therefore the first part of the review is to gain and learn and, uh, about the response, uh, how we have all performed in this at global and national level, and how we can learn to optimize the response going forward. However, the, the obviously a review of this nature and with the, with the seniority of the panel members uh, or the panel chairs uh, will work with the member states now to identify uh, further panel members um, uh, to join that panel and it will be they that will set the pace for that review and they will consult with the member states again they will consult and work with the director general to ensure that the the pace and nature of the evaluation does not interfere with the day-to-day -day response and, and I trust given the seniority uh, of, the, of the, the two wonderful leaders that have been chosen uh, I believe uh, they and the panel members, the member states and the Director General of WHO will find the appropriate pace uh, and the appropriate approach that will allow us both to learn the lessons of this response at all levels but at the same time not to interrupt or disrupt what is a very important pandemic response right now. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I think Mike had uh, already said it all. Uh, the decision uh, in the resolution by the Assembly was at the earliest appropriate time uh, and it gives uh, the responsibility actually to, to me, which is um, uh, very uh, important uh, so that, you know, uh, we can uh, have uh, a balancing act so that the um, uh, evaluation doesn't affect uh, the response and that's why the uh, member states didn't make it very specific they said at the appropriate earliest appropriate time and we felt that starting it now can really help us uh, to understand as we respond uh, how uh, the whole uh, response is, is, is happening and um, as uh, Mike said uh, we will continue to make sure that uh, the evaluation actually doesn't affect uh, the response and we will uh, do, uh, we will balance as much as possible. So it's a matter of uh, balancing act. And we have very able uh, two co-chairs now and um, the panel members also, we expect uh, them to be uh, the best people uh, we can really uh, have. 
and all member states will be involved in contributing to uh, the panel uh, members, some candidates. Of course, it will be up to the co-chairs uh, in consultation with me to uh, select uh, the members, and um, I think that will also uh, hopefully uh, help us in, in balancing the um, uh, capacity of the panel itself. And there will be an independent secretariat. Um, it's not, we're not going to use a WHO secretariat uh, for, for, the, for the panel, uh, meaning we will have additional manpower that will uh, work on this, not only the panel, but the independent secretariat uh, too. Uh, so we will do everything to, to balance it. But as uh, the Independent Oversight Advisory Committee said, it's also our concern that the, you know, the mid, the, you know, evaluate, evaluation in the middle of the response could have some effect, but we will do everything to, to balance it in order to learn as we go. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros and Dr. Ryan. Uh, our next question comes from Antonio Brioto of EFE, the Spanish uh, Newswire. Antonio, and please be wel you're welcome to ask in Spanish if you prefer. Uh, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Very well. Please go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, I will make my, my question in, in English, if I may. Um, Les quería preguntar por los rebrotes aislados que se están produciendo, en, por ejemplo, en mi país, España, pero también en, en otras partes del mundo. Eh, ¿Ustedes creen que era algo que podía preverse con los desconfinamientos? ¿Entraba en cierto modo dentro de lo, de lo esperado? ¿Y cómo deben actuar los gobiernos en estas circunstancias? ¿Qué medidas deben aplicar para que no se regrese a los confinamientos masivos? Muchas gracias. Um, I think that's a fundamentally important uh, observation, actually, and uh, um, I think that uh, it was to be expected, and I think we and many other scientists uh, around the world have said that once lockdowns uh, were, were ended, that there was always the risk that the disease could bounce back, because if the virus is present, it will uh, potentially take all opportunities to transmit. Uh, our advice has been, I think, uh, quite consistent in advising countries, number one, to open up slowly in a stepwise uh, fashion, to wait between different phases of reopening, to ensure that the data on the virus is clean and clear and tells you where your problems are, to be ready to move backwards or forwards depending on what that data is telling you, and to accept the fact that in our current situation, uh, it is very unlikely that we can eradicate or eliminate this virus. There are very particular environments in which that can occur, island states and other places, but even they risk re-importation. We've seen countries who've managed to get to zero or almost zero re-import virus from outside. So there's always a risk, either from within or from bringing disease back in. Uh, and therefore, it is a given that there is always a risk of further cases. Uh, the transmission that occurs in that situation uh, can be single sporadic cases, which can be relatively easily isolated and quarantined. A more worrying pattern is large clusters of cases that could occur in association with super spreading events, events in which there are large crowds gather, the virus is present and you get a small explosion of cases, which can very quickly um, mushroom into a much larger case. It's, it's very analogous to a, to a, to a forest fire. Uh, a small fire uh, is hard to see, but it's easy to put out. Uh, a large fire is hard to see, or easy to see, but very difficult to put out. So you really need a system where you can detect the small flames, the small embers that may be there. You can detect a small fire and put that out by good surveillance, by good detection, by aggressive testing, and then by isolating cases, quarantining cases. Throughout all of this, and I think this is probably very central message that when the virus is present there is a risk of spread. The authorities can have surveillance in place, the authorities need to have that in place, isolation, quarantine, all of those other measures and testing, but ultimately it comes down to communities and individuals and how we protect ourselves and how we protect others. When the virus is in your community, uh, the guy, it is quite clear that there are things you 
and your community can do to reduce the risk of those infections. And it's very important that people feel empowered, that they have the knowledge to be able to do that. So it requires a very strong partnership, a trusting partnership between communities and authorities, a trusting partnership based on honesty, based on transparency, based on regular information that everybody can trust, and based on a sustained effort by everybody. It is very tough right now. Uh, it is very tough for everyone to maintain the kind of vigilance that people are being asked to maintain. It is tough. It's not easy. Uh, but we have to be able to sustain that. So if we want to avoid, uh, after lockdown, having major epidemics, we need to watch out for the small uh, clusters and we need to extinguish those clusters quickly. We all need to remain vigilant. We need to remain vigilant with our physical distancing, with our hygiene, with mask wearing in the appropriate settings. In that situation, we can potentially avoid the worst of having second peaks and having uh, um, to have to move backwards in terms of lockdown. It is also, and you've seen this in a number of countries, are managing to deal with clusters and, and with flare-ups by having limited geographic lockdowns, locking down small areas in order to contain the disease. And I think it, it is a matter of scale. Um, countries can and should be able to contain the disease through those measures. We all want to avoid uh, whole countries going back into total lockdown. That is not a desire that anybody has. But there may be situations in which that is the uh, only option. But the, this is a fundamental question right now for everyone, for every community, for every society. It is going to require sustained effort. It's going to require a lot of trust. It's going to require clear messaging. It's going to require a huge investment in sustained public health effort uh, and a massive investment in community empowerment and the capacity of us as individuals in our communities to act and to stay safe. Maria, you may want to add. Thank you, Mike. Uh, yes, so, I mean, as Mike has said, I think this is something we all need to anticipate, that there's the possibility that there could be a resurgence, there could be these small outbreaks. But I think what we had been have been advising is in these situations to, is to act fast, to, to act comprehensively. You know, use the public health infrastructure that you have in place. Many countries have worked incredibly hard to improve the infrastructure that's in place to be able to find cases, test cases, isolate cases uh, very quickly. Um, and if they have symptoms, if they develop disease, to ensure that they are cared for appropriately in the appropriate facilities. To put contact tracing uh, to the test, c carry out contact tracing as, as comprehensively as possible, quarantine the contacts so that you break those chains of transmission. Um, and inform, inform the communities often, regularly, honestly, thoroughly, because the situation is evolving and we know how, how quickly these embers can really turn into these forest fires. Um, and with that hope that t if restrictions need to be put in place, they're put in place temporarily. They're put in place in a limited geographic region only to help um, and that they're not put in place for long periods of time. Um, but it is possible that these small outbreaks, that these small clusters can be prevented into being turned into large outbreaks. We've seen this time and time again. So it is possible. Um, and, and as Mike has said and as we have said, be part of the response. Everyone has a role to play. If you're asked to stay home and you can stay home, please do. If you're feeling unwell, stay home. Call your health care provider to find out. Call the hotline. Find out the next steps that you need, you need to take. Um, because everybody needs to play a part in this and it will take some time while we f take some time while we figure out how to get through this together. Um, but it is to be expected, but we have tools in place and governments have worked incredibly hard, communities have worked very hard, individuals have worked very hard. We just need to put those tools in use again. Thank you, Dr. Ryan and Dr. Van Kerkhoff. The next question comes from Bin Chen from Shanghai Media Group. Bin, if you wish to speak, um, ask your question in Chinese, we've got the translation service, so please do. Hi, thank you. Um, I think I will continue to ask my question in English. Uh, thank you for taking my question. So my question is a follow-up regarding the independent panel. We currently know that the panel's two chairs are selected and they could choose other panel members. So I would like to ask how many more panel members will be selected and experts in which areas are the panel and the WHO exactly looking for? 
for example, policymakers, medical professionals, or specialists in public health. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So the number of uh, uh, the size of the panel, uh, there was some discussion, of course, but n not yet decided. And uh, the co-chairs will decide finally as they see uh, fit. And then the panel uh, members, of course, um, will be uh, a mix of uh, professionals. Uh, and again, uh, this will be up to the uh, co-chairs after uh, developing the terms of reference, based on the terms of reference to select people who would really fit into the terms of uh, reference. So these are things that are going to be done once the co-chairs start uh, uh, actually uh, working on, on uh, this uh, assignment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. The next question comes from Jacqueline Howard from CNN. Jacqueline, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Yes, thank you for taking my question. Uh, I wanted to ask, we've noticed reports circulating about a pneumonia in Kazakhstan that may be, quote, deadlier than COVID. That's what some of these reports are saying. So I wanted to ask if this is something that WHO is investigating uh, or can um, there be any more information shared about whether these reports are accurate or, or whether this is something on your radar. Thank you. Um, yeah, yes, uh, this is certainly on our radar and uh, we've been tracking uh, COVID-19 uh, across all of uh, Europe and particularly in the Central Asian uh, republics including Kazakhstan. Um, the, on July the 5th, uh, Kazakhstan went back into a, a, a lockdown as COVID-19 cases have actually spiked. The first lockdown was from March 16th until um, May the 11th. Uh, this second lockdown is expected to last two weeks. Uh, as of July the 7th, we have uh, just under 50,000 cases reported uh, from Kazakhstan with 264 deaths. Um, the, uh, there are a number of explanations uh, that can explain the uh, reported uh, 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 rise in the number of uh, pneumonias uh, in, in Kazakhstan, and we're working with the uh, authorities there to, uh, to, to investigate. Uh, more than 10,000 uh, uh, laboratory confirmed cases of COVID-19 have been reported by national authorities over the last uh, seven days. So there's been a big surge in actual COVID cases itself. Uh, we're looking at the, at the actual testing and the quality of the testing to make sure that there haven't been false negative tests for some of those other pneumonias that have provisionally tested negative. And that is likely to be a, a major cause of this, that in, in, that in, in many ways the, the, many of these uh, pneumonia cases may also, uh, will also be COVID-19. They just have not been diagnosed correctly. But again, that remains to be seen. Uh, and uh, we're also re uh, working with the authorities there to look at x-rays and review x-rays and look at the patterns of the pneumonias to make sure that they're consistent with COVID-19. So while we believe that many of these cases will be diagnosed as COVID-19, we keep an open mind. We're working very closely with authorities. Our team on the ground is working very closely with the authorities there. Uh, to track this and ensure that uh, that, that is the case. Uh, there are clusters of atypical pneumonia can occur anywhere in the world at any time. It can be caused by uh, diseases as, as wide ranging as Legionella, Chlamydia, influenza and other things. So there are always other potential causes for, uh, for uh, clusters of atypical pneumonia and we always keep an open mind until we have definitive diagnosis. But the upward trajectory of COVID-19 cases in the country uh, would suggest that many of these cases are in fact uh, undiagnosed cases of COVID-19. But as I said, we keep an open mind until we have an absolute confirmation of the diagnosis of these uh, clusters. Maria? Thank you, Dr. Ryan. And now we have a question from Helen Branswell from Stat News. Helen, could you unmute yourself and please go ahead. Hi, thanks very much for taking my question. I think it's from Mike. Um, Mike, could you give us an update on the um, Ebola outbreak in Ecuador province in DRC? Thank you. Uh, yes, Helen, I will. And I'll, what we'll do is maybe pass to uh, another question and I'll come 
I'll come back on that because uh, I want to give you some numbers. You're a numbers person, so I can give you the general answer, but I can give you maybe a more specific numbers-driven answer in a few minutes. So if you could uh, take the next question, and I'll just pull out the numbers for, for Helen. Thanks, Helen. So I'll, I'll put you at the end of the queue, but you, we'll definitely come back to you. Okay, so now we have a question for, for, from Shoko Koyama from NHK Japan. So Shoko, could you unmute yourself and go ahead? Hi, Margaret. Can you hear me? Very well. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you for taking my question. So my question is regarding the airborne transmission. Uh, according to the science scientific brief released yesterday, airborne transmission of the virus can occur in health care settings and some outbreak reports related to indoor cr uh, crowded spaces have suggested the possibility of aerosol transmission. But based on the evidence you have so far, do you recognize the airborne transmission as a realistic danger in our daily lives? And what's your recommendation to the general public? Thank you. So thanks for the question, um, and yes, so you've highlighted a, a scientific brief that we published yesterday on uh, transmission of the COVID-19 of COVID and the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. And in this scientific brief, it's not a guidance document, it's a brief um, which summarizes all available literature and evidence that we have about how the virus is transmitted. Uh, when the virus transmits between people as it relates to their infection and what this means in terms of breaking chains of transmission. Um, we look at droplet, we look at aerosol, we look at fomite, we look at fecal oral, we look at lots of different modes. And our attempt to do this is to consolidate everything that we know about this virus. It's not a systematic review and there's new literature being published and being released every single day. So this is a living review. We call this a living review, which means it will be updated regularly. Within the brief, uh, we talk about droplet and we talk about aerosol. Your specific question is about aerosol transmission. And aerosol transmission is one of the modes of transmission that we have been concerned about since the beginning, um, particularly in healthcare settings where there are known to be these medical procedures called airborne generating, aerosol generating procedures, where we know that these droplets can be aerosolized, which means that the particles can stay uh, suspended in the air for longer periods of time. In those situations where the, the health worker is actually carrying out those procedures and for people working in those areas, we recommend airborne precautions, which is a certain type of per personal protective equipment for health workers. Outside of healthcare settings, um, there is the possibility that there could be aerosol aerosolized particles in specific settings like indoor settings where there are crowded conditions, um, where there's poor ventilation, and where people are spending prolonged periods of time. And so what we've seen is that there are some outbreaks that have been reported in these closed indoor settings with poor ventilation, um, which include what you had mentioned, the nightclubs, which have uh, included choirs, uh, fitness centers, where airborne transmission could, cannot be ruled out. Uh, in those outbreaks, there could also be the droplet transmission and fomite, the contaminated surface transmissions. What we are calling for is more uh, systematic research to be done in these types of settings. So it's not just how and when uh, transmission happens, it's the settings in which they happen. So we need a much better understanding of these particular settings and these outbreaks that are happening so that we could better understand how transmission is happening. In terms of everyday life, um, every, everyday life, we recommend a comprehensive set of packages which include physical distancing, which does include hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette, which includes the use of fabric masks when you cannot do physical distancing, um, and it, to, to ensure that when you have these closed settings that you have good ventilation. So it's a combination of packages. But um, the dominant route of, of transmission from all of the available evidence and our understanding and working with large groups of, of different um, uh, disciplines um, collectively is droplet in contact, although there may be other modes of transmission which we don't rule out. Um, so we have requested and we will be through our R&D blueprint, which we uh, began working on since February, um, is to accelerate research in this area to make sure that we have well-conducted studies so that we could better determine the different roles of transmission, different modes of transmission, um, and so that all of the advice that we give is as up-to-date as possible. 
Thank you very much. Dr. Van Kerkhoff, now I have a question from Simon Ateba from Today News Africa, who I understand has a burning question about smoking and COVID. Simon, please go ahead. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, this is Simon Ateba from Today News Africa in Washington, D.C. Um, uh, my first question is on pregnant women, and it goes to Dr. Maria. I was wondering if WHO knows how this virus affects pregnant women and if uh, and how it affects their babies. And if you may allow me, I also would like to know how, if there is a correlation between COVID-19 and smoking, and if smoking makes things worse or things better. Thank you. Yes, perhaps I can start with smoking. Good afternoon. Um, we know that if you're a smoker, um, the likelihood of developing more severe symptoms uh, for COVID um, are higher. Um, we know that um, the, um, the, the way uh, you can uh, attract uh, COVID uh, is not yet established whether there's a combination with smoking at all. So what you can say is if you're a smoker, you should stop smoking straight away. Um, because of the likelihood of having more severe symptoms. Do we take the second question? Okay, okay. Um, you snuck a second question in there. So, yeah, so thank you for your question about uh, COVID-19 and, and pregnant women. Um, of course, we are, we are always concerned about COVID-19 in any, in any population, and of course, in particular, pregnant women. Um, what we understand from the studies, this is something our clinical uh, management um, team uh, looks very closely at, and within our clinical guidance, we have specific recommendations for pregnant women. Um, we understand that uh, among women who are pregnant, um, they don't seem to develop a different type of disease than women of the same age who are not pregnant. However, there are some studies that have come out recently uh, that have looked at um, pregnant women with underlying conditions. And if there are women with underlying conditions, they are at a higher risk of developing more severe disease. Um, and so that, this is something we need to ensure that we, we keep a close eye on and ensure that, that pregnant women have the right care throughout their pregnancies. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. So now we have a question from Jamil Chade. Jamil, please go ahead with your question. Yes, can you hear me, Margaret? Very well, please go ahead. Very good. Thank you very much for, for taking my question. Um, we have seen in the last couple of days President Bolsonaro taking proudly his chloroquine. Um, my question to you, uh, did anything change uh, in terms of uh, studies or are you still st sticking to uh, the point that actually uh, this drug, uh, at least uh, so far, has not shown any kind of um, evidence in terms of science. What is your position in terms of taking chloroquine, uh, not uh, to reduce medical um, uh, hospitalized uh, days, but uh, as, for example, President Bolsonaro is taking at the moment? Thank you very much. Um, it's difficult to, to comment on any specific individual use of hydroxychloroquine. Um, and we have s uh, said many times previously that uh, hydroxychloroquine should be used in the context of COVID under, only under strict uh, medical supervision, and, and we would assume that that is the case in this case. Uh, the, the findings regarding hydroxychloroquine for hospitalized patients uh, do not uh, demonstrate differences in mortality, although there are lots of different studies out there, uh, and uh, at present, uh, WHO uh, does not advise its use in, in hospitalized patients um, on the basis that, uh, that uh, the drug has not clearly demonstrated the benefits uh, to, to those who take it. Uh, the, but that is then for individual clinicians to make determinations regarding the use of the drug uh, on, a, on an off-label basis. We can only report what we see from uh, randomized control trials and other observational studies. Uh, and in the end, it is for national authorities to determine what the use of the drug is in their context. And it is then obviously for the use of, uh, for, the, for individual clinicians to decide on how to use that knowledge in the treatment of their patients. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. And I have now have a question from Gabriella Sotomayor. Gabriella, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Hola, ¿qué tal? Eh, muchas gracias por tomar mi pregunta. Eh, yo quisiera saber cuál es el, el forecast, o sea, el pronóstico para México en estos momentos de la pandemia. Siguen aumentando los casos. Esta semana se registraron más de 6,000 casos diarios. Ayer, más de 7,000 en un solo día. Y preocupa que un gran porcentaje de las muertes no ocurre en los hospitales. Entonces, ¿cuáles son los que enfrenta en estos momentos México? Gracias. I think it's difficult to uh, predict the uh, trajectory of, of any epidemic uh, in, 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 in countries uh, at the moment. But certainly uh, Mexico now has, I think, the, the fifth highest uh, COVID-19 death toll and has had uh, 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 record-breaking days in the last week, uh, recording nearly 7,000 cases on a, on a single day, with its total cases uh, now surpassing a quarter of a million. Um, Mexico at the same time is, is in the process of reopening um, and uh, in that period the, the number of uh, cases has, has increased significantly and again this is a pattern we've seen in many other countries opening uh, economies uh, in the midst of uh, intense community transmission can lead to an acceleration of cases that is not unique uh, at all to the Mexican situation. And Mexico, like other countries, is, is balancing the uh, demands of communities to get back to work and, and, and to be able to earn livings with the, the, the significant risk of increased and intensified and accelerated COVID trans, transmission. Um, the, uh, uh, um, so I think uh, from the perspective um, of Mexico, Mexico and other countries in this situation, um, may face increase uh, and a continued increase in cases over time because as I said in previous intervention today if the virus is present if the virus is transmitting uh, efficiently at community level and communities continue to mix and engage in normal activity and public health surveillance is weak uh, in that situation and there's not the ability to identify cases quickly as Maria has said investigate quickly if these two things don't work together in concert and if you reach a point where the number of cases exceeds the capacity of the public health system to chase down the contacts and cases, exceeds the capacity of the health system to cope with the number of severe cases, then we're right back where we started in, 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 in February and March with systems effectively failing in the face of the pressure of the number of infected. Uh, we need to try and avoid that. And again, the question in a country the size that is Mexico and many other countries like it is to really look at the subnational level, see where the virus is under control and where continued reopening can continue, to understand where your hotspots are and where you may have to slow down or reverse parts of that reopening, intensify public health surveillance, intensify communications with, with communities. And again, it comes down to a certain extent to trust. There must be consistent, clear messaging on risk from authorities, from leaders and others. We must be honest with our communities about the spread of the disease in our communities. We must communicate that risk uh, appropriately and we must give people the information they need to maintain proper social distance, to engage in proper personal hygiene, to wear masks where appropriate. And we must support our communities in doing that and consistently message that uh, in, an, in, an appropriate, in an appropriate way. Again, it is difficult for countries, especially when the individual economic consequences to individual families are negative. If you cannot go to work, uh, and you cannot earn money and you cannot feed your family, there is a huge consequence from that. And we fully understand the pressures that people themselves are under and we fully understand from that the pressures that governments are under. But we have to find a way to balance these two important issues. We have to find a way to balance the COVID-19 acceleration against the economic reopening because it's very, very clear from a, from a number of countries that opening 
in a situation where you have intense community transmission and weak public health response leads to a difficult uh, situation that may push a whole country back in terms of the progress that it makes. Uh, and that is, that is not in, inconsequential. And uh, blind reopening, uh, uh, not associated with a careful stepwise process based on data, based on open communication, uh, may not lead to where anybody wishes to go in any country, Mexico included. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. The next question is on COVID and smoking. And this one comes from Jim Roop. Jim uh, from Westwood One Radio News. Jim, please go ahead. Oh, hi. Thank you very much. As I look at this question, though, that I typed to you, and I was happy if you would just pass it along yourself. That would have been fine, but I appreciate this. I realize this is one of those stupid questions because I think the answer is obvious, but I'll ask it anyway. The question was with COVID-19 and uh, smoking, Her, Her Royal Highness said that people who smoke are more likely to contract the virus and also more likely to spread it. So my question was, what's the spreading aspect of it? Is it because the virus can linger in smoke? Is it because of the exhale factor? Is it because when you smoke, you don't wear a mask? And then I realize it's probably all of the above. Uh, but if I'm wrong, you can answer it. If not, then I guess, Dr. Mike, you can answer the Ebola and the DRG question. Thank you. I can, I can take you there. Yeah, it, as I said, it, it leads to more severe disease. Um, and that is uh, the main cause. And that's why at the moment we know that uh, 680 million people want to quit smoking. And we know that 400 million, that's our latest estimate, will try to smoke, uh, stop, will try to stop smoking. And that's the good news. And uh, with uh, today's initiative, we hope that uh, we will be successful in really uh, helping 20 million to succeed in this. So that's um, actually the, the final estimate that we have. Thank you very much, Dr. Kresh. I now have a question from Kai Kupferschmidt, and then we'll hear answer Helen's question. Kai, please go ahead. Thanks. Um, actually, <laughs> my question has already been asked, so um, let me use the chance to just ask about um, how the way forward is looking in terms of um, treatments. I mean, we obviously, you know, have, have some negative results on some, um, some experimental treatments. Is, is it becoming clearer what the next ones are that need to be tested? Because I think we're kind of getting to that second phase. Well, I, I, can, I can start, uh, and, and perhaps Mike would like to supplement on this one because that's a big question that you asked, and it's a good one. Um, what I can say is within our, within our uh, clinical management network and also within the R&D blueprint, you know that there's a number of, of therapeutics and drugs that are currently under evaluation, and those clinical trials are underway. Uh, there's a lot of small trials, and of course we have the solidarity trial that, that is underway. What, I, what, we, what the clinical network is doing and with, with R&D partners is um, working with um, those that are carrying out those clinical trials to follow them in real time. Um, because many of them are small, there are possibilities that we could try to combine the data coming in from some of those studies so that we can get a quicker answer to these questions. Um, I don't have any specifics on which one is the next one um, because I think that's the, the trillion dollar question here. But I think that there are a number of therapeutics that are in development that will, ha will uh, cover different aspects of the disease, um, whether they are you know, the prevention of, of developing more severe disease or preventing people from dying. Um, but there are a lot that are, that are currently underway and there's a huge number of clinical trials. Mike, do you want to add anything to that? Um, no, I think, uh, I think you've, uh, you, you've said it all. I think the, the, the clinicians who came together last week uh, at the research forum had essentially the, that same view. Uh, there are lots of existing therapies. We've seen even today more data suggesting that some existing therapies for other diseases uh, may have some impact. I think this is important. We continue to find potential treatments in the drugs we already have and being able to pick the best of those candidates and bring them into the solidarity and other trials is very important. And that's why the solidarity recovery 
um, and discovery trials were designed as multi-arms. They allow us and other partners in the UK, France and other places across many, many countries to bring in new drugs into that armory uh, of potential drugs. They, the bigger question is new molecules and new, new drugs that, that are being discovered because they obviously have a much longer pathway to be used in humans. The advantage we have with existing drugs is that many of them have strong safety profiles and are already approved for use in other diseases and they can be relatively easily introduced into randomized control trials against COVID because we already have a strong clinical and safety profile for those drugs. Uh, other drugs, new molecules that are developed have to go through the whole rigor of the scientific, the safety discovery process and it takes much longer to bring those drugs into randomized control trials because they have to go through primary safety studies first. Uh, and uh, that does slow down the process uh, by which those molecules become available. But as Maria said, there are many, many, many of those molecules currently in development. Um, and there are other treatments uh, like hyperimmune globulin, uh, which are clearly uh, already being used in trials. And we also have monoclonal antibodies, which I think sh show uh, some great hope. We've certainly used uh, monoclonal antibodies to very, very good effect in Ebola uh, in, Con in, in Congo. Um, and I think they've been groundbreaking in, in, in reducing mortality. Both two monoclonal antibodies have been highly successful in reducing fatality and have transformed the way we manage uh, Ebola as a disease in the field. So I do think there are some uh, potential platforms, types of drugs out there that may uh, result in, in, in a much faster cycle to get those diseases to all people who need them. Uh, but uh, again, I, it's a complex uh, area and what we're really, really pleased for is the level of collaboration between institutes, between clinicians, between hospitals, between every different kind of uh, physician, uh, doctor, nursing organization out there. I mean, we've seen today fantastic information uh, summarized on the neurologic impacts of these diseases. We've seen other fantastic summaries of the cardiovascular impacts. And what we're seeing, I think, is one of the fastest accelerations of knowledge of the pathophysiology and the impact of this disease. And that in itself is providing very interesting insights for what we're treating. So when we look at a drug like uh, dexamethasone currently in trials, uh, we can attack this virus in two ways. We can attack the virus by treating the virus, in that sense trying to use drugs that will impede the virus's capacity to hurt us, but we also have, can treat the impact of the virus by mod modulating the immune response to the virus at certain stages, which prevents our systems overreacting uh, and dampening down inflammation. Uh, we, can, we also need to look under uh, various other interventions underway using statins and other drugs that may prevent some of the blood clotting impacts. So we either have to manage the virus itself or treat the virus itself or the consequences of having the virus. And there's a tremendous amount of good work underway in that. And the more we understand the disease and its impact, the more we can design treatment pathways and options to be used in future. So I'm very hopeful uh, in terms of the levels of collaboration and the levels of innovation that are underway. And I'm very confident that we will find uh, therapies over time. Uh, and I think it bodes well for the future of emerging diseases in general. For in general for our ability to collectively deal with pandemics. One of the most important things in dealing with a new disease is to gain an understanding of how that virus or how that disease operates in the human body and understand how it impacts human organs, how it spreads and how it affects the immune system. The more we understand that and the more rapidly we understand that, the more we create the space for the innovators in the pharmaceutical and the pharmacology side of things to develop the countermeasures that we need. So I'm actually while we're desperately needing more therapies, I believe the world probably at this point could not be doing more collectively in order to uh, develop those uh, countermeasures that we need. Sorry, to give it a specific example of this science solutions and solidarity, one of the things that we're looking into, um, and Dr. Janet Diaz mentioned this the other day, is actually trying to operate a new model of working together and we reached out to a number of PIs that are working on a specific therapeutic, for example, so that they can work with us on a prospective meta-analysis where they agree to share data on their individual trials and we can actually pool this um, and we do these analyses as the trials are still going. 
so that we are learning and that we are able to understand how these therapeutics work so that when we need to adapt our guidance, if we need to adapt our guidance, that could be done in real time. And that's a new model of working. Um, and, I, and again, as Mike has said, this is, this is incredible um, solidarity and collaboration to be able to agree to share this bef as these trials are ongoing. So it's something that we are trying, it's something that we're working very hard to do, and we're very grateful for the PIs that have agreed to, to do this with us. Thank you, Dr. Van Kerkhove. So we're well over the hour, and um, I'd like to update the numbers for Helen Branswell uh, offline, uh, if that's okay, Helen. I'll be in contact with you. I'll just hand over to Dr. Tedros for any final words. Uh, thank you, thank you, Margaret, and thank you to all for uh, joining, and uh, see you on Monday. Thank you.